smashed the porcelain pagoda, a multicolored tower of glazed tiles, considered the most beautiful structure of its kind in China. For the remainder of the 19th century, Nanking slumbered in peace and obscurity. When the Manchu emperors Rei assumed their reign of China from the northern city of Peking, Nanking became nothing more than a cultural relic. It would the fall of Nanking 63 not regain its importance until the nationalists overthrew the king and anointed Nanking as China's capital, which it officially became in 1928. By 1937, the year of the rape, the old Nanking, the Nanking of the Qing dynasty, was competing with the new Nanking of the nationalists. Vestiges of the old China remained in the streets of the capital. The restaurant vendors balancing tiny rice bowls and teapots on baskets from poles, the hand weavers, hunching over looms of silk in open air factories, the noodle shop workers stretching pasta by hand, the tinsmiths jangling their tinwares through the streets, the cobblers mending shoes before the doors of their customers, the candy made before the eyes of eager children, clutching copper coins with square holes in the middle, the men with squeaking wheelbarrows piled so high with reeds that one could see neither the wheelbarrow nor the man. Yet the new was everywhere, in the asphalt roads that gradually replaced dirt and cobblestone paths, in the electric and neon lamps that replaced the last of the flickering gaslight, candle, and oil lamps, in the water that flowed from taps instead of being sold on the streets by the casketful. Honking buses and automobiles, filled with military officials, bureaucrats, and foreign diplomats, wove their way past rickshaw pullers, mule carts laden with vegetables, and ambling crowds of pedestrians, and animals, dogs, cats, horses, donkeys, even the occasional water buffalo, or camel. But part of the old seemed as if it would never change. Encircling the city was an ancient, immense stone wall built during the Ming Dynasty, a wall that one missionary called one of the greatest wonders of the world. Surely he proclaimed, if one were permitted to drive on top of it, that person would see one of the most spectacular views in China. From atop the wall, at the southern tip of the city, one could see beyond crenellated gray battlements, the dust gray brick of the working class districts, the red and blue tile roofs of some of the more affluent homes then, peering northward, some of the taller, modern buildings of the government district, the ministries and embassies built in western-style architecture. Gazing toward the northeast, one might detect the glisten. In white sun Yat-sen mausoleum, against the darker sweep of purple mountain, and dots of country villas, owned by the wealthiest and most powerful citizens of Nanking. Then looking to the northwest, one might catch glimpses of the industrial activity on the waterfront. The fingers of smoke from the factories, the inky smudge of the coal port, the steamships and gunboats near the dock, the tracks of the North China Railway, and the Shanghai Nanking Railway, slashing across the city and horizon to intersect at the station in Ziyuan, a northern suburb. Along the horizon one might see the giant, brawling, cocky-colored waters of the Yangtze River, curving west and north, beyond the walls of Nanking. In the summer of 1937, all these lustrous, cacophonous parts of Nanking lay under a blanket of somnolence. The air, soggy with humidity, had long earned the capital its title as one of the three furnaces of China. The heat, mingled with the pungent odor of the night soil, of nearby fields drove many of the rich out of the city, during the worst of the summer heat, to seaside resorts. For those who remained, summer was a time of frequent naps, of lazy swishes of reed, or bamboo fans of houses, draped with bamboo matting to shade them from the sun. In the evenings neighbors, fled from the ovens of their homes, by pulling lawn chairs into the streets, to gossip the night away, and then to sleep in the open air. Few could predict that within months war, would march by their very doorsteps, leaving their homes in flames, and their streets drenched with blood. On August 15, Chang Xiao Sung, an instructor of psychology at Jinling College, had just lain back in bed for a nap when she heard the shriek of a siren. Are they giving us an air raid practice? She thought. Why didn't I see an announcement in the morning papers? When fighting had broken out between Chinese and Japanese forces in Shanghai earlier that month, forcing the Nanking government to ready itself for possible enemy attacks elsewhere as well, Chinese officials not only held practice air raid and the fall of Nanking 65 drills in the city, but ordered residents to camouflage their houses and create bomb shelters. Across Nanking men, painted black the red rooftops and white walls of their houses, or dug holes in the ground, to hide in.
It was as if the city were preparing for a funeral on a large scale, remembers Chang eerily. So on August 15th, when she heard a second signal, Chang took notice. But her friends in the house convinced her that it was just another practice, and so she again went back to bed, until she heard a dull rumbling sound, like that of a cannon. Oh, it is thunder one friend, said and went back to reading her novel. Chang returned to bed, ashamed of being overly excited, until she heard the unmistakable sounds of machine gun fire, and airplanes overhead. Nanking was experiencing its first aerial bombardment, in history. For the next few months Nanking would, endure dozens of Japanese air raids, forcing residents to hide in basements, trenches, and dugouts in the ground. Japanese pilots bombed the capital indiscriminately, hitting schools, hospitals, power plants, and government buildings, and prompting thousands of people both rich and poor, to flee the city. Frank Shing, now a practitioner of oriental medicine, in San Francisco, recalls the hectic, nightmarish conditions under which he and his parents left Nanking during the autumn of 1937. Then a boy of 11, he packed his precious collection of slingshots and marbles for the journey, while his grandmother gave his father, a railway mechanic, bracelets of jade and silver to pawn, in the event of future emergency. The train that bore his family to Hankow was so packed that hundreds of refugees, unable to get seats, sat on top of the compartments, while others also unable to get seats literally strapped themselves underneath the train, their bodies hanging only inches above the tracks. Throughout the journey Xing heard rumors that people had fallen off the train or rolled under the wheels. Xing himself barely survived the trip when Japanese bombers attacked the train, forcing his family to jump out and hide in a cemetery. My own grandparents nearly separated forever during the evacuations from Nanking. In the autumn of 1937, my grandfather Chang Tian Chun, a poet and journalist, was working for the Chinese government to instruct officials in nationalist party philosophy. The Japanese bombardment of the capital forced him and his family to hide repeatedly in ditches, covered by wooden planks and sandbags. By October he had decided it was unsafe, for my grandmother then a pregnant young woman, in her early twenties, and my aunt a one-year-old infant, to remain in Nanking. Both returned to my grandmother's home village, in the countryside, a village near Ising, a city on the banks of Taihu Lake, between Nanking and Shanghai. In November, on the anniversary of Sun Yat-sen's birth, my grandfather left the city to see his wife and family. Returning to Nanking just a few days later, he found his entire work unit busy packing up in preparation for their evacuation from the city. Told that provisions had been made for the unit to leave by ship from the city of Wuhu on the banks of the Yangtze River, my grandfather sent word to his family to meet him there immediately. They almost didn't make it. With aerial bombing, the Japanese had destroyed the railway tracks between my grandmother's village and the city of Wuhu. The only route was by Sampan, through the intricate network of tiny waterways that laced the entire region. For four long days, my grandfather waited anxiously at the docks scanning boatload after boatload of war refugees. By the fourth day, his family still had not arrived, leaving him with a choice that no man should ever be forced to make. Board the next and final boat out of Wuhu, in the belief that his wife and daughter were not on their way to Nanking, or stay, in case they were, knowing full well that shortly thereafter the city would be overrun. In despair, he screamed his beloved name, Yu Pei, to the heavens. Then like an echo, from far away, he heard a reply. It came from one last sampan, approaching the docks in the distance, a tiny sampan bearing his wife, his daughter, and several of my grandmother's relatives. My mother always told me that their reunion was a miracle. The fall of Nanking 67 unlike my grandparents, many residents of Nanking remained in the city through much of November, some choosing to take a wait-and-see attitude, others staying because they were too old or too poor to do anything else. For them November brought consistently bad news the battle had not gone well in Shanghai. Long files of Chinese soldiers, many of them mere boys, some no older than 12, were returning from the battle F on, exhausted wounded, and demoralized, marching in grim silence, or riding in huge trucks draped with the ban. Nurs of the Red Cross, those who could took solace from the fact that new units of heavily armed troops could be seen marching through the streets to the waterfront where they boarded junks towed by tugs on their way to the battlefront.
Obviously, the fight was not over. Through rain and howling wind, small modem Chinese tanks rumbled from the capital toward Shanghai, next to lines of pack mules, weighed down with cotton uniforms, blankets, rifles, and machine guns. Later that month the dreaded news finally reached Nanking. Shanghai the New York City of China had fallen. More than 200,000 Japanese troops now stood between the ocean and the capital while some 700,000 Chinese troops fell back in retreat. They brought the news no one wanted to hear. With Shanghai in ruins, the Japanese were now headed for Nanking. The loss of Shanghai came as a blow to Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the nationalists. Faced with the loss of China's largest metropolis, Chiang tried to resolve a difficult dilemma. Whether to defend Nanking against the Japanese, or move the entire capital to safer ground. In the end the Generalissimo decided to do both. But rather than stay and defend Nanking himself, he shifted the burden to someone else, a subordinate called Tang Shengche. The relationship between Chang and Tang Shengche was strange and highly complex. Neither really trusted the other. Indeed, at different points in their lives, the two men had been expedition. For example, as the nationalists tried to unite the country, Tang helped Chang wage battle against feudal warlords. But Tang had never shown Chang any particular loyalty, and power struggles between the two men resulted twice in Tang's exile from China, once to Hong Kong, and then again to Japan. In 1931, however, when the crisis erupted between the Chinese and Japanese over Manchuria, Chang summoned Tang back into service in an effort to strengthen Chinese defenses. Tang rose swiftly through the Chinese military hierarchy, and by 1937, he had become Chang's director of military training. In November 1937, during several high-level military conferences on the issue of defending or abandoning Nanking, Tang, virtually alone among Chang's advisors, spoke up in support of providing a strong defense. By defending Nanking, he argued Chinese troops could simultaneously slow the advance of the Japanese army and give the rest of the Chinese military a chance to rest and reorganize. But when Chang asked who would stay and lead the defense, Tang and the other officials were quiet. Singling Tang out, Chang presented him with an ultimatum. Either I stay, or you stay. In the presence of his peers, Tang undoubtedly felt he had no choice. How can we let the Generalissimo stay? Tang asked. He promised that he would remain in Nanking and fight to the death. The decision to entrust Tang with the defense of Nanking made big news. On November 27, Tang gave a press conference to boost morale. Before reporters he delivered a rousing speech, vowing to live or die with Nanking. His speech was so passionate that when it ended, reporters gave him a big round of applause. But some reporters noted that Tang also appeared to be extremely agitated. In fact, he had just recovered from a major illness and in the words of one foreign correspondent, he seemed dazed if not doped. He sweated so profusely that someone handed him a hot towel to dry his brow. The fall of Nanking 69, perhaps Chang knew that his advisor was in no shape to do battle with the seasoned Japanese military and had appointed him merely to make it appear as if the Chinese were really going to put up a strong defense. Or perhaps caution told Chang to be ready with a second plan just in case. What we do know is that during the latter half of November, the second plan went into effect. First Chang ordered most government officials to move to three cities west of Nanking Changsha, Hankou, and Chongqing, stoking rumors among the few officials left behind that they had been abandoned to whatever fate the Japanese planned for them. Within days official-looking cars, packed with luggage clogged the streets, then just as quickly, such cars disappeared altogether. Buses and rickshaws also left, with the departing government officials, leaving the city with no public municipal transportation. Indeed soon almost every truck was gone, even those trucks that were used primarily to transport rice from the countryside to Nanking. And then, in mid-November, 50,000 Chinese troops arrived to take the place of departed government officials. Arriving from upriver ports, they first unloaded boxes and boxes of weapons on the waterfront and then started to occupy empty government buildings of their choosing. By December an estimated 90,000 Chinese troops populated the Nanking area. The troops transformed the face of Nanking, 
Chinese soldiers dug trenches in the streets, laid down underground telephone wire and strung barbed wire over city intersections intersections that began to resemble battlefields. The troops also fortified the city wall, installing machine gun readouts along the ancient battlements. They shut all gates except three, keeping narrow passageways, open only for military transport. Gates were barricaded with sandbags 20 feet deep and reinforced with wood and angle iron. At least one of them was walled up entirely with concrete. In early December, the military also resolved to clear by fire a mile-wide battle zone around the entire circumference of the city walls, regardless of the cost and suffering involved. The cost was incalculable. Along the outskirts of the city, the inferno consumed petrol and ammunition, barracks agricultural research experimental laboratories, a police training school, and mansions in Mausoleum Park. In the countryside soldiers torched straw huts, farmhouses with thatched roofs, trees bamboo groves, and underbrush. Not even major Nanking suburbs were spared. Troops herded residents from Ziyakwan and districts around the south gate into the city walls before incinerating their neighborhoods. People whose houses had been targeted for destruction were told to move out within hours or risk being arrested as spies. The military justified the burning as a strategic move to eliminate any structure of potential use to the invader. But one foreign correspondent pointed out that charred walls could serve the Japanese almost as well as actual buildings for shelter against ammunition. He speculated that the fire was really an outlet for rage and frustration for the Chinese, a desire to leave the Japanese with little more than scorched earth, and so a city prepared for invasion. Anyone and anything with the strength, the judgment, the money, or the opportunity to leave began to get out. Whole museums were packed and carted away. On December 2nd, hundreds of boxes of palace musum treasures, practically the whole of China's cultural heritage, were loaded onto a boat for safe storage outside the city. Six days later, on December 8th, Chiang Kai-shek, his wife, and his advisor fled the city by plane. There was no longer any doubt. The Japanese siege of Nanking was about to begin. For decades one of the mysteries of the rape of Nanking was how with so many soldiers in place the city of Nanking fell in just four days on the evening of December 12, 1937. The troops, after all, possessed enough ammunition to last through at least five months of siege. As a result, many survivors, journalists, and historians attributed the collapse to a loss of nerve among the Chinese soldiers. They also branded Tang, a villain who abandoned his troops when they most needed him. Later history based on newer documents suggests a somewhat different picture. During the Battle of Shanghai, the Japanese Air Force of almost 3,000 planes dwarfed the tiny Chinese Air Force of 300. In other ways, the Chinese were no match aerially for the Japanese. During the Battle of Shanghai, Italian-trained Chinese pilots wreaked havoc on the city, dropping bombs near western ships and even on crowded streets and buildings within the international settlement. But even a bad air force is better than no air force, and that was the situation presented to Tang. On December 8, the day Chang and his advisors left the city, so too did the entire Chinese Air Corps. Tang fought the next four days without the benefit of any strategic aerial data on Japanese movements, rendering even the expensive Chinese fort guns on the hills and mountains around Nanking much less effective. Second, the government officials who moved to Chongqing took with them most of the sophisticated communications equipment. Thus, one part of the army could not talk to another. Third, the troops did not come from the same regions and literally had trouble speaking to each other. One paramedic in Nanking recalled that the Chinese military doctors spoke Cantonese while the Chinese soldiers spoke Mandarin, a situation that created endless confusion in the hospitals. Fourth, many of the soldiers in this army became soldiers overnight, having been kidnapped or drafted against their will into the army from the countryside. A substantial number had never held a gun in their hands before Nanking. Because bullets were scarce, few were wasted teaching these recruits how to shoot. Of those soldiers who had previous experience, many had just come back from Shanghai. Tired, hungry, and sick, most were much too exhausted to finish the necessary preparation work of building barricades and digging trenches in the city.
worst of all Chinese soldiers, felt little sense of cohesiveness or purpose. In a battle report about conditions in Nanking, a Chinese military officer noted that whenever troops occupied an area, they tended to idle about rather than take the initiative to help other troops engaged in nearby battles with the Japan as the commanding officers apparently were no better. They did not trust each other, the report observed, and for this reason, the Japanese were able to move from one area to another defeating Chinese armies one by one. On December 9, Japanese airplanes began dropping leaflets near Nanking written by Matsui Iwane, one of the three Japan as generals. The best way to protect innocent civilians and cultural relics in the city, the message read, was to capitulate. The message promised that the Japanese would be harsh and relentless to those who resist, but kind and generous to non-combatants and to Chinese troops who entertain no enmity to Japan. It demanded that the city surrender within 24 hours by noon the next day, otherwise all the horrors of war will be let loose. Publicly Tang expressed outrage at the terms of the ultimatum. Throwing the leaflet to the ground, he dictated two orders that were distributed among the troops. The first order forbade the army to retreat. Our army must fight to defend every inch of the front line, the order read. If anyone does not follow this order and retreats, he will be punished severely. The second order prohibited any military group from using boats privately to cross the river. If any military units possessed boats, they were required to turn them over to the transportation department. Tang designated the 78th Army as the unit responsible for directing and handling transportation matters, and warned that any military personnel found using boats for private purposes would be punished. Privately however, Tang negotiated for a truce. Despite his original promise to fight to the last man, he seemed eager to do anything to avoid a showdown in the city. Supporting him in this stance were the few Americans and Europeans still in the city. These selfless individuals, about whom we will learn more later, had decided to remain in Nanking to do what they could to help, and had created the International Committee for the Nanking Safety Zone. One of their first steps was to cordon off an area of the city and declare it the Nanking Safety Zone, or the International Safety Zone, with the understanding that the fall of Nanking 71 anyone within the zone of two and a half square miles, Chinese or non-Chinese, was off limits to the Japanese. Now in a final effort to save lives, they offered to try to arrange a truce with the Japanese. Their plan was to suggest a three-day ceasefire, during which the Japanese could keep their present positions and march into Nanking peacefully while the Chinese troops withdrew from the city. Tang agreed to the proposed truce and asked the committee to send a message from him to Chiang Kai-shek through the U.S. Embassy. The plan was transmitted by radio on the USS Panagon boat to the Generalissimo. Chang promptly rejected it. On December 10, the Japanese waited for the city to surrender. At midday two Japanese staff officers stood outside the mountain gate in the eastern wall to see whether the Chinese government would send out a delegation with the flag of truce. When none arrived, the Japanese high command ordered a furious bombardment of the city. The next few days saw intense fighting between the Chinese and Japanese troops around Nanking. The Japanese dropped bombs on the city and pounded the walls with heavy artillery fire. Tang would later reveal the gravity of the situation near certain landmarks and gates of the city in a long rambling and desperate telegram to Chiang Kai-shek. From the 9th to the 11th of December the Japanese forced their way through Guanghuaman three times, first the military train and corps tried to resist them, then the 156th Division bitterly fought back, killing many of the enemy and holding the gate. Starting noon on the 11th, bad news came frequently from the Yuhuatai area, and men, Fontman fell to the enemy, ordered immediately the 88th Division to shrink the front line, coordinate with the 74th Army, 71st Army rapidly transferred, 154th Division to help. But worse news awaited Tang, and this time the bad news would come not from the enemy's successes, but from Chang himself. At noon on December 11th, General Gu Zhutong placed a telephone call to Tang's office. Orders had come directly from Chang. Gu informed Tang for a massive retreat of Tang's forces.
Tang himself was to hurry to Pukau, the site of a ferry and railway terminal that lay across the river from Nanking, where another general would wait to pick him up and bring him to safety. Tang expressed shock. Aside from the fact that he was being asked to abandon his troops, an unattractive alternative for any leader, he had another very real problem. His troops were at that moment engaged in furious fighting. He informed Gu that the Japanese had already penetrated the troops' front lines. An orderly retreat was not even a possibility. It would readily turn into a rout. I can't worry about that, Gu Zhudong said. Anyhow, you have to retreat by tonight. When Tang again detailed the likely consequences of a sudden and hasty retreat, Gu reminded him that he Tang had been personally ordered by Chang to cross the river tonight. Leave a subordinate behind to handle the situation if you have. To Gu told Tang, but you must cross the river tonight he repeated. Impossible Tang said. The earliest he could cross the Yangtze was the next night. Gu warned him to leave town as soon as possible for the situation with the enemy had grown urgent. That afternoon Tang received a telegram from Chang confirming the order. Commander-in-Chief Tang, if you cannot maintain the situation, you should take the opportunity to retreat in order to preserve and reorganize left bracket the army right bracket for future. Counterattack Kai 11th. Later that day the distressed Tang received a second telegram from Chang, again urging retreat. Unable to hold the line and under pressure, Tang complied. It was a decision that resulted in one of the worst disasters of Chinese military history. At 3 a.m. on December 12, Tang held a pre-dawn meeting at his home. As his vice commanders and top staff gathered before him, Tang told them sadly that the front had fallen, that there was no way for them to defend the gates of the city, and the fall of Nanking 75 that Chiang Kai-shek had ordered the troops to retreat. He told his subordinates to prepare for the retreat by printing copies of the order and other related documents. That afternoon, at 1 p.m., the orders were distributed among the Chinese military. But then electrifying reports reached Tang. Tang hoped to Ray move his troops via the Yangtze River. Now he learned that the Japanese Navy was minesweeping the river to the east of the island of Baguazhu and steaming its way to Nanking. Its arrival would block that escape route, the last from the city. With the situation dire, Tang again approached the International Committee for the Nanking Safety Zone on 5 Ninghai Road, asking Edward Sperling, a German businessman, for help in negotiating a truce with the Japanese. Sperling agreed to take a flag and message to the Japanese, but later reported to Tang that General Matsui had refused his offer. That afternoon, just minutes before his commanders gathered for a second meeting, Tang watched from the window of his house as an entire city took flight, the streets jammed with cars, horses, and refugees, the young and the old, the weak and the strong, the rich and the poor. Anyone with half a brain was determined to get out while he still could. At 5 p.m., the meeting began. It lasted only 10 minutes. Many of the top military officials did not attend because communication between the field commanders and central command had all but collapsed. Others never received notification of the meeting because they had assessed the situation for themselves and run away. The Japanese, Tang told those gathered in his home, had already broken through the gates of the city and penetrated the wall in three places. Do you still have any confidence to hold the defense line? He asked the group. Although he waited several minutes for a response, the room remained silent. After this pause, Lang calmly discussed strategies for retreat. The evacuation would start within minutes at 6 p.m. and last until 6 a.m. the next day. One portion of the army, the 36th Division, and the military police would cross the river from Ziaquan and gather at a designated village on the other side. The rest of the army, he announced, would have to force its way out of the Japanese encirclement with the survivors. Congregating at the southern region of the Enwa province, weapons, ammunition, and communications equipment left behind were to be destroyed, and all roads and bridges in the path of the retreating army burned. Later in the same meeting, Tang modified his order. He informed his men that if the 87th Division, 88th Division, 74th Army, and Military Training Corps could not break through the Japanese encirclement, then they too should try to cross the river. Tang now gave five divisions the authority to cross the Yangtze River, doubling the original number of men involved in the operation.
That evening Tang would himself journey to the docks. It would be a journey he remembered for the rest of his life. Not surprisingly, the order to retreat through the Chinese military into an uproar. Some officers ran about the city, haphazardly informing anyone they came into contact with to pull out. These soldiers took off. Other officers told no one, not even their own troops. Instead they saved their own hides. Their soldiers continued to fight the Japanese. Thinking they were witnessing a mass desertion, when they saw other troops fleeing, they machine-gunned hundreds of their fleeing comrades in an effort to stop them. In the haste and confusion to leave the city, at least one Chinese tank rolled over countless Chinese soldiers in its path, stopping only when blown up by a hand grenade. Even in the larger, tragic scheme of things, the retreat had its comic moments, as soldiers grew desperate to blend into the populace, and thereby elude capture, they broke into shops to steal civilian clothes and undressed in the open. The streets soon filled not only with half-naked soldiers, but with half-naked police officers, who had discarded their uniforms, to avoid being mistaken as soldiers. One man roamed about wearing nothing but his underwear and a top hat, probably stolen from the home of a wealthy government official. In the early stages of the retreat, when a semblance of order remained, entire sections of the Chinese army were shedding the folly of Nanking 77 their uniforms, changing into civilian clothes and marching in formation, simultaneously. But when the retreat turned into a rout, the scramble for clothes grew urgent. Soldiers were actually seen throwing themselves on pedestrians and ripping clothes off their backs. There was only one way to get out of the city safely without encountering the Japanese, and that was through the northern harbor to the Yangtze River, where a fleet of junks were waiting for those who could get there first. In order to reach the harbor, soldiers had to first move up the main artery of Chungshan Road, and then pass through the northwest gate of the city, called the Achang, or Water Gate, before they could enter the northern port suburb of Xiaquan. But before the gate lay a scene of almost unbelievable congestion. One problem was that thousands of soldiers, many in trucks, cars, and horse-drawn wagons, were trying to squeeze themselves through the narrow 70-foot tunnel. The trickle of men had turned into a river by 5 p.m. and a flood by late evening as everyone tried to funnel through the tiny opening of the gate. Another problem was that the retreating soldiers had discarded countless armaments and supplies to lighten their load for the journey across the river and the resulting heaps of hand grenades, buses, machine guns, coats, shoes, and helmets near the gate of the city blocked traffic. A barricade that had been built near the gate also blocked half the road. The area was ripe for disaster. Tang witnessed much of this chaos from the window of his chauffeured black car on his way to the docks. As the car maneuvered through tangles of people, he heard pedestrians curse him. How can you ride in a car at a time like this? They yelled unaware that the passenger in the car was Tang Shangche. Tang pretended not to hear and shut his eyes as the car inched turtle-like to its final destination. He was supposed to arrive at the docks by 6 p.m., but it was 8 p.m. Before he finally got there, absolute bedlam greeted Tang at the riverfront. Military officers were arguing with each other over which pieces of equipment to destroy and which to ferry across the Yangtze River. While soldiers tried to balance tanks on rows of boats bound together, much of it capsized and sank anyway. As the night progressed, the soldiers focused on getting themselves across and abandoned the tanks and equipment. The scene grew violent as boats grew scarce and in the end some 10,000 men would fight over two or three vessels, struggling to cram themselves aboard or to scare off others by firing shots in the air. Terrified crews tried to ward off the surging mob by swinging axes down on the fingers of soldiers who clung to the sides of their junks and sampans. Innumerable men died trying to cross the river that night. Many never even made it past the gate. That evening a fire broke out on Chungshan Road, and the flames swept through heaps of ammunition, engulfing houses and vehicles. Horses ensnarled in traffic panicked and reared, heightening the confusion of the mob. The terror-mad soldiers surged forward, their momentum pushing hundreds of men into the flames and hundreds more into the tunnel, where they were trampled underfoot. With the gate blocked and an inferno raging nearby, the soldiers who could break free from the mob made a wild rush to climb over the walls. 
hundreds tore their clothing into strips and knotted them with belts and putties to make rope ladders. One after another, they scaled the battlements and tossed down rifles and machine guns from the parapets. Many fell and plummeted to their deaths. When the last boats disappeared, soldiers dove into the waters on makeshift flotation devices, hugging or sitting on wooden railroad tracks, logs, boards, buckets, bathtubs, or doors stolen from nearby houses. When the last pieces of wood disappeared many attempted to swim across, meeting almost certain death. Tang and two vice commanders boarded a tiny coal-driven launch and waited until 9 p.m. For two more military staff members, who never arrived. From the launch Tang would have heard the noise and screams of people fighting with each other, mingled with the louder punctuated sounds of Japanese cannon fire. Then there was the sight, the sight of Nanking, on fire. The conflagration lit the dark sky bright. The fall of Nanking, 79 one can only imagine the thoughts of the humiliated Tang as his launch moved across the river. His last glimpse of Nanking was of a city in flames, its people frantically trying to save themselves, his own troops hanging onto driftwood to stay afloat in the dark cold waters of the Yangtze. He would later tell friends that while he had fought in hundreds of battles over 20 years, he had never experienced a day as dark as that one. BYTHF time, the Japanese passed through the gates of the city, all those residents who possessed any degree of money, power, or foresight had already left, for parts unknown. Approximately half the original population departed. Before the war, the native population of the city exceeded 1 million people, and by December it had fallen to about half a million. However, the city was swollen, with tens of thousands of migrants, from the countryside, who had left their homes for what they believed would be safety, within the city walls. Those who remained after the soldiers departed tended to be the most defenseless, children the elderly, and all those either too poor, or physically weak to secure a passage, out of the city. Without protection, without personal resources, without a plan, all these people had was hope that the Japanese would treat them well. Many likely talked themselves into the belief that once the fighting stopped the Japanese would of course treat them civilly. Some may have even convinced themselves that the Japanese would be better rulers after all, their own government had clearly abandoned them in their hour of need. Weary of fire, weary of bombardment, and weary of siege, scattered groups of Chinese actually rushed out to welcome the Japanese invaders as they thundered into the city with their tanks, artillery, and trucks. Some people hung Japanese flags from their windows while others even cheered the Japanese columns as they marched through the south and west gates of the city. But the welcome was short-lived. Eyewitnesses later claimed that the Japanese soldiers, who roamed the city in groups of 6 to 12 men, fired at anyone in sight as soon as they entered the capital. Old men were found face down on the pavement, apparently shot in the back on whim. Civilian Chinese corpses lay sprawled on almost every block many who had done nothing more provocative than MN away as the Japanese approached. In the war crimes transcripts and Chinese government documentation, story after story of what happened next begins to sound, even in all its horrific dimensions, almost monotones. With few variations, the story goes something like this. The Japanese would take any men they found as prisoners, neglect to give them water or food for days, but promise them food and work. After days of such treatment, the Japanese would bind the wrists of their victims securely with wire or rope and herd them out to some isolated area. The men, too tired or dehydrated to rebel, went out eagerly, thinking they would be fed. By the time they saw the machine guns, or the bloodied swords and bayonets wielded by waiting soldiers, or the massive graves heaped and reeking with the bodies of the men who had preceded them, it was already too late to escape. The Japanese would later justify their actions by saying that they had to execute POWs to save their own limited food supply and prevent revolts. But nothing can excuse what the Japanese did to hundreds of thousands of helpless Chinese civilians in Nanking. They had no weapons, and were in no position to mutiny. Six weeks of horror 83, not all Chinese, of course, submitted easily to extermination in Nanking. The rape of Nanking is a story not only of mass victimization, but of individual strength and courage.
One here were men who clawed their way out of shallow graves or clung to reeds for hours in the icy Yangtze River or lay buried for days under the corpses of friends before dragging their bullet-ridden bodies to the hospital sustained only by a tenacious will to survive. There were women who hid in holes or in ditches for weeks or ran through burning houses to rescue their babies. Many of these survivors later gave their stories to reporters and historians or testified at the war crimes trials held in Nanking and Tokyo after the defeat of Japan. When interviewing several of them during the summer of 1995, one learned that many of the Chinese victims of the Japanese were apparently murdered for no other reason than pleasure. Such was the observation of Tang Shunsen, now in his 80s, a Nanking resident who had miraculously survived a Japanese killing contest back in 1937. The killing contests unlike thousands of hapless civilians who were bombed out of their homes and stranded on the streets of Nanking, Tang had actually secured a haven during the massacre. Then a 25-year-old shoemaker's apprentice, Tang hid in the home of two fellow apprentices, on Xiomangu, a tiny street in the northern part of the city. His friends known to Tang as Big Monk and Little Monk had camouflaged the doorway of their house by removing the door and filling the open space with bricks so that it resembled, from the outside, a smooth, unbroken wall. For hours they sat on the dirt floor of the house, listening to the screams and gunshots outside. Tang's problem began when he experienced a sudden urge to see a Japanese soldier with his own eyes. All his life he had heard that the Japanese looked like the Chinese, but never having been to Japan, he had been unable to verify this. Here was a golden opportunity to see for himself. Tang tried to suppress his curiosity, but finally succumbed to it. He asked his friends to remove the bricks from the doorway to let him out. Not surprisingly, his friends pleaded with Tang not to go, warning him that the Japanese would kill him if they caught him wandering around outdoors. But Tang was not so easily dissuaded. Big Monk and Little Monk argued with him at length but finally gave up trying to change his mind. Risking their own safety, they removed the bricks from the door and let Tang out. As soon as Tang stepped outside, he began to regret it. A scene of almost surreal horror gripped him. He saw the bodies of men and women, even the bodies of small children, and the elderly pulled before him in the streets. Most had been stabbed or bonneted to death. Blood was splattered everywhere, Tang recalled of that horrible afternoon, as if the heavens had been raining blood. Then Tang saw another Chinese person in the street, and behind him, a group of eight or nine Japanese approaching in the distance. Instinctively Tang and the stranger jumped into a nearby mbish bin, heaping straw and paper over their heads. They shivered from cold and fear, causing the sides of the bin to shiver with them. Suddenly the straw was knocked away. A Japanese soldier hovered overhead, glaring at them, and before Tang quite knew what was happening the soldier had decapitated the person next to him with his sword. Blood gushed from the victim's neck as the soldier reached down and seized the head as a trophy. I was too frightened to even move or think Tang remembered. I thought of my family and knew that if I died here, they would never know what happened to me. Then a Chinese voice ordered Tang out. Gun Chu Lai, roll out, exclaimed a Chinese man, whom Tang suspected was a traitor for the Japanese Gun Chu Lai, or I'll kill you. Tang crawled out of the trash bin. Seeing a ditch by the road, he wondered whether he should fling himself into it and attempt an escape, but found that he was too frightened even to move his legs. Then he saw a group of Japanese soldiers heard six weeks of horror 85 ing hundreds of Chinese people down the street. Tang was ordered to join them. As he marched next to the other prisoners, he saw corpses sprawled on both sides of the streets, something that made him feel so wretched he almost welcomed death. Before long Tang found himself standing near a pond and a fleshly dug rectangular pit filled with some 60 Chinese corpses. As soon as I saw the newly dug pit I thought they might either bury us alive or kill us on the spot. I was too frightened to move so I stood there motionless. It suddenly occurred to me to jump into the pit but then I saw two Japanese military wolf dogs eating the corpses. Tihi Japanese ordered Tang and the other prisoners to line up in rows on each side of the mass grave. He stood in one closest to the edge, 
Nine Japanese soldiers waited nearby soldiers, who presented an imposing sight to Tang with their yellow uniforms, star-studded caps, and shiny bayonets and rifles. At such proximity, Tang could see that Japanese men really did resemble Chinese men, although at this point he was too frightened to care one hen. To Tang's horror, a competition began among the soldiers, a competition to determine who could kill the fastest. As one soldier stood sentinel with a machine gun, ready to mow down anyone who tried to bolt, the eight other soldiers split up into pairs to form four separate teams. In each team, one soldier beheaded prisoners with a sword, while the other picked up heads and tossed them aside in a pile. The prisoners stood frozen in silence and terror as their countrymen dropped, one by one. Kill and count, kill and count, Tang said, remembering the speed of the slaughter. The Japanese were laughing. One even took photographs. There was no sign of remorse, at all. A deep sorrow filled Tang. There was no place to run. I was prepared to die. It saddened him to think that his family and loved ones would never find out what happened to him. Lost in such thoughts, Tang snapped back to reality when the commotion started. Two rose up from him, a pregnant woman, began to fight for her life, clawing desperately at a soul. Dear who tried to drag her away from the group to rape her. Nobody helped her, and in the end, the soldier killed her, ripping open her belly with his bayonet and jerking out not only her intestines, but a squirming fetus. That Tang believes should have been the moment for them all to rebel, to do something, to fight back and try to kill the soldiers, even if they all died in the process. But even though the Chinese prisoners greatly outnumbered their Japanese tormentors and might have been able to overwhelm them, no one moved. Everyone remained eerily docile. Sad to say, of all the people around the pit, Tang remembers only the pregnant woman showing the slightest bit of courage. Soon a sword-wielding Japanese soldier worked his way closer to Tang, until he was only one row up from him. Then Tang had a stroke of luck, which was nothing short of a miracle. When the soldier decapitated the man, directly in front of Tang, the victim's body fell against Tang's shoulder. In keeping with the corpse's momentum, Tang also toppled backwards and dropped, together with the body, into the pit. No one noticed. Tang ducked his head, under the corpse's clothing. His ploy would have never worked had the Japanese stuck with their original game of decapitation. In the beginning the soldiers used the heads of their victims to keep score. But later, to save time, they killed prisoners not by lopping off heads but by slashing throats. That is what saved Tang, the fact that dozens of bodies were piling up in the pit with their heads intact. The killing spree lasted for about an hour. While Tang lay still, feigning death, the Japanese pushed the rest of the bodies on top of him. Then as Tang recalls, most of the soldiers left the scene, except for one who thrust his bayonet into the mass grave repeatedly to make sure everyone was dead. Tang suffered five bayonet wounds without a scream, and then fainted. Later that afternoon, at about 5 p.m., Tang's fellow apprentices Big Monk and Small Monk came to the pit hoping to retrieve his corpse. Through a crack in the brick wall of their house, they had seen the Japanese herd Tang and the others away, and assumed that he was now dead, with all the others. Six weeks of horror 87 but, when they found Tang moving under the heap of bodies, they pulled him out immediately, and ushered him back to the house. Out of the hundreds of people killed that day during the competition, Tang was the only survivor. Torture the torture that the Japanese inflicted upon the native population at Nanking almost surpasses the limits of human comprehension. Here are only a few examples. Live burials. The Japanese directed burial operations with the precision and efficiency of an assembly line. Soldiers would force one group of Chinese captives to dig a grave, a second group to bury the first, and then a third group to bury the second and so on. Some victims were partially buried to their chests or necks so that they would endure further agony, such as being hacked to pieces by swords or run over by horses and tanks. Mutilation. The Japanese not only disemboweled, decapitated, and dismembered victims, but performed more excruciating varieties of torture. Throughout the city they nailed prisoners to wooden boards and ran over them with tanks, crucified them to trees and electrical posts, carved long strips of flesh from them, and used them for bayonet practice. At least 100 men reportedly had their eyes gouged out and their noses and ears hacked off before being set on fire.
Another group of 200 Chinese soldiers and civilians were stripped naked, tied to columns and doors of a school, and then stabbed by Jizi, special needles with handles on them, in hundreds of points along their bodies, including one their mouths, throats, and eyes death by fire. The Japanese subjected large crowds of victims to mass incineration. In Ziaquan a Japanese soldier bound Chinese captives together, ten at a time, and pushed them into a pit where they were sprayed with gasoline and ignited. On Taping Road, the Japanese ordered a large number of shop clerks to extinguish a fire, then bound them together with rope and threw them into the blaze. Japanese soldiers even devised games with fire. One method of entertainment was to drive mobs of Chinese to the top stories or roofs of buildings, tear down the stairs and set the bottom floors on fire. Many such victims committed suicide by jumping out windows or off rooftops. Another form of amusement involved dousing victims with fuel, shooting them and watching them explode into flame. In one infamous incident, Japanese soldiers forced hundreds of men, women, and children into a square, soaked them with gasoline, and then fired on them with machine guns. Death by ice. Thousands of victims were intentionally frozen to death during the rape of Nanking. For instance, Japanese soldiers forced hundreds of Chinese prisoners to march to the edge of a frozen pond, where they were ordered to strip naked, break the ice, and plunge into the water to go fishing. Their bodies hardened into floating targets that were immediately riddled with Japanese bullets. In another incident, the Japanese tied up a group of refugees, flung them into a shallow pond, and bombarded them with hand grenades, causing an explosive shower of blood and flesh. Death by dogs. One diabolical means of torture was to bury victims to their waist and watch them get ripped apart by German shepherds. Witnesses saw Japanese soldiers strip a victim naked and direct German shepherds to bite the sensitive areas of his body. The dogs not only ripped open his belly, but jerked out his intestines along the ground for a distance. The incidents mentioned above are only a fraction of the methods that the Japanese used to torment their victims. The Japanese saturated victims in acid, impaled babies with bonnets, hung people by their tongues. One Japanese reporter, who later investigated the rape of Nanking, learned that at least one Japanese soldier tore the heart and liver out of a Chinese victim to eat them. Even genitals, apparently were consumed. A Chinese soldier, who escaped from Japanese custody, saw several dead people in the streets with their penises cut off. He was later told that the penises were sold to Japan six weeks of horror, 89 as customers, who believed that eating them would increase virility. The rapes if the scale and nature of the executions in Nanking are difficult for us to comprehend, so are the scale and nature of the rapes. Certainly it was one of the greatest mass rapes in world history. Susan Brown Miller, author of the landmark book Against Our Will. Men, Women and Rape, believes that the rape of Nanking was probably the single worst instance of wartime rape inflicted on a civilian population, with the sole exception of the treatment of Bengali women by Pakistani soldiers in 1971. An estimated 200,000-400,000 women were raped in Bangladesh during a nine-month reign of terror following a failed rebellion. Brown Miller suspects that the rape of Nanking surpasses, in scale even the raping of women, in the former Yugoslavia, though it is difficult for her to say for sure. Tain because of the unreliability of Bosnian rape statistics, it is impossible to determine the exact number of women raped in Nanking. Estimates range from as low as 20,000 to as high as 80,000. But what the Japanese did to the women of Nanking cannot be computed in a tally sheet of statistics. We will never know the full psychic toll, because many of the women who survived the ordeal found themselves pregnant, and the subject of Chinese women impregnated by Japanese rapists in Nanking is so sensitive that it has never been completely studied. To my knowledge, and to the knowledge of the Chinese historians and officials at the Memorial Hall, erected in memory of the Nanking Massacre, not a single Chinese woman has to this day come forward to admit that her child was the result of rape. Many such children were secretly killed. According to an American sociologist in the city at the time of the massacre, numerous half-Japanese children were choked or drowned at birth. One can only guess at the guilt, shame, and self-loathing that Chinese women endured when 
They faced the choice of raising a child they could not love or committing infanticide. No doubt many women could not make that choice. Between 1937 and 1938 a German diplomat reported that uncounted Chinese women were taking their own lives by flinging themselves into the Yangtze River. We do know however that it was very easy to be a rape victim in Nanking. The Japanese raped Nanking women from all classes. Farm wives, students, teachers, white-collar and blue-collar workers, wives of YMCA employees, university professors, even Buddhist nuns, some of whom were gang-raped to death. And they were systematic in their recruitment of women. In Nanking Japanese soldiers searched for them constantly as they looted homes and dragged men off for execution. Some Actu ally conducted door-to-door -door searches demanding money and huaguniang young girls. This posed a terrible dilemma for the city's young women, who were not sure whether to remain at home or to seek refuge in the international safety zone the neutral territory, guarded by Americans and Europeans. If they stayed in their houses, they ran the risk of being raped in front of their families. But if they left home in search of the safety zone, they ran the risk of being captured by the Japanese in the streets. Traps lay everywhere for the Nanking women. For instance, the Japanese army fabricated stories about markets where women could exchange bags of rice and flour for chickens and ducks. But when women arrived on the scene, prepared to trade, they found platoons of soldiers waiting for them. Some soldiers employed Chinese traders to seek out prospective candidates for rape. Even in the safety zone, the Japanese staged incidents to lure foreigners away from the refugee camps, leaving women vulnerable to kidnapping raids. Chinese women were raped in all locations, and at all hours. An estimated one-third of all rapes occurred during the day. Survivors even remember soldiers prying open the legs of victims to rape them, in broad daylight, in the middle of the street, and in front of crowds of witnesses. No place was too sacred for rape. The Japanese attacked women in nunneries churches and Bible training schools. Seventeen soldiers raped one woman in succession in a seminary compound. Every day, 24 hours a day, the Dogong Daily newspaper testified of the great rape of Nanking. There was not one hour when an innocent woman was not being dragged off somewhere by a Japanese soldier. Old age was no concern to the Japanese. Matron's grandmothers and great-grandmothers endured repeated sexual assaults. A Japanese soldier who raped a woman of 60 was ordered to clean the penis by her mouth. When a woman of 62 protested to soldiers that she was too old for sex, they rammed a stick up her instead. Many women in their eight these were raped to death and at least one woman in that age group was shot and killed because she refused a Japanese soldier's advances. If the Japanese treatment of old women was terrible, their treatment of young children was unthinkable. Little girls were raped so brutally that some could not walk for weeks afterwards. Many required surgery. Others died. Chinese witnesses saw Japanese rape girls under 10 years of age in the streets and then slash them in half by sword. In some cases, the Japanese sliced open the vaginas of preteen girls in order to ravish them more effectively. Even advanced stages of pregnancy did not render women immune to assault. The Japanese violated many who were about to go into labor, were in labor, or who had given birth only a few days earlier. One victim who was nine months pregnant when raped suffered not only stillbirth but a complete mental collapse. At least one pregnant woman was kicked to death. Still more gruesome was the treatment allotted to some of the unborn children of these women. After gang rape, Japan as soldiers sometimes slashed open the bellies of pregnant women and ripped out the fetuses for amusement. The rape of women frequently accompanied the slaughter of entire families. Uuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuu
The soldiers thrust a perfume bottle in her vagina and also killed the baby by bayonet. Then they went into the next room where they found Mrs. Shaw's parents and two teenage daughters. The grandmother, who tried to protect the girls from rape, was shot by revolver. The grandfather clasped the body of his wife and was killed immediately. The soldiers then stripped the girls and took turns raping them. The 16-year-old by two or three men, the 14-year-old by three. The Japanese not only stabbed the older girl to death after raping her, but rammed a bamboo cane into her vagina. The younger one was simply bonneted and spared the horrible treatment meted out to her sister and mother a foreigner later wrote of the scene. The soldiers also bonneted another sister, aged eight, when she hid with her four-year-old sister under the blankets of a bed. The four-year-old remained under the blankets so long she nearly suffocated.